back here for another week on MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. I'm Ryan Drury. I'll be joined by Clarky and Steve Sabrin. First, we will chat with the new commissioner of the GOJHL, Brent Garbett, on their quest to become a designated junior A-League. Lots of questions there for Brent, and he provides some great answers. Then we've got to break it down with poor Clarky. Another Leafs collapse in the first round to the hated Montreal Canadiens. We'll discuss what went wrong in Clarky's estimation anyway. And we welcome back our regular wage expert from cool bet chris abbott back from vacation to talk about a number of bets to make this weekend you're listening to and watching mwo sports brought to you by coolbet.co this is mwo sports Welcome back to another week here on MWO Sports. Ryan Drury joined again by Clarkie and Steve Sabrin. We're very pleased to be joined by a great special guest, the new commissioner of the GOJHL. Brent Garbutt is joining us. Brent, how are you? Great. How are you guys doing? Nice to see you. Can't complain. We're looking forward to hockey getting back to normal next year. Uh, but the main thing on the docket right now, your league is petitioning the Ontario Hockey Association to become a junior A loop instead of the junior B designation that it currently carries. Obviously, you guys have gotten a lot of support on the online petition. I believe it's well over twelve or 1,300 signatures now online. Brent, just take us through why you believe the GOJHL should be classified a junior a loop yeah i just think the opportunity right now that uh the players in our footprint aren't being provided um it, i think it's it does seem pretty simple and i, I think it kind of is obviously to change it, it it isn't but um it's the only area in canada that has junior hockey that doesn't have junior a so it's a pretty big footprint i mean it's the second largest uh second largest area uh in canada in terms of uh, hockey canada participants and registrants. So, uh, that's a pretty big chunk of, uh, of players under the hockey can umbrella that are kind of being excluded right now, that opportunity, and they're having to leave home to be able to, uh, play junior A. Hey Brent, are all the teams, the club teams around, uh, this area, uh, on board with this? Was there any heated discussions as you went down this road? No, no, there, there weren't any heated discussions, maybe some discussions just about kind of the, uh, the process and things like that. Um, I mean, this is well before my time, even well before my time where I started working in junior hockey in Ontario that uh, it's been going on. So I think it's just been, it's been long enough. And they finally, finally, uh, our group just finally said, let's, we gotta, we gotta go with this. We just can't keep, can't keep uh, doing this anymore and allowing uh, these reasons, uh, whatever they are to, to stop uh, or, or just accept it, I guess. And so that's kind of what we're, what we, where we've gone. Unfortunately, we haven't ha- been able to have a formal discussion with uh DOHA or uh at, at the moment and uh a motion one of our members put forward in terms of their AGM was was uh denied to proceed as well so uh right now we're, we're trying to just get our message out there and and feel uh get all the support we can just kind of some awareness before we kind of move on to the next phases of, of hopefully uh resolving this uh, Brent, why make the jump? What are some of the advantages of going to Junior A as opposed to staying uh, Junior B designation? Yeah, the biggest one is that we we just want it within the, within the OHA. I mean, uh, CJHL does govern uh, Junior A hockey across Canada, and that would be something to be great, uh, great to be a part of. But the whole reason for this is uh, we're a community-driven league, and we want to be able to keep our players within our community. We want to give them the opportunity to... Uh, stay here if they want to be able to play the highest level and not have to kind of chase that a label and right now that's what's happening players are leaving home to to go play in junior a designated leagues that we believe uh are on par or some or some are inferior to our league so just because they have that designation some players are leaving home and traveling a great distance from home to do that um so that perception that that moniker gives us it it, uh the people who know our league know how good it is in there but some that aren't necessarily as familiar they might pass up on an opportunity to, to, to go scout a junior a game because uh, even make maybe make a longer trip because it's it's labeled junior a until they uh find out for themselves i guess just how comparable and how many good players uh the play, uh, we have so brent if you you said you couldn't get on the agenda for a meeting there what what's your recourse if you can't uh break through there what what's your next steps to to make this happen yeah, it's it's pretty fluid situation. So we're uh, 
kind of being adapted. We do have a plan. We obviously can't really say exactly what that is because of <laughs> can't have that out there of kind of what we're doing next. But uh, we're we're just trying to solve this civilly, and we want to. We think it it demands a a, a conversation, probably in multiple bodies across uh, across maybe even across Canada and other organizations that uh, think think it's pretty hard that if you put it in front of someone, especially who didn't really know about it, they, they would look at it and go, why is it like this? It doesn't really make any sense. And even the ones that kind of do, knowing it just kind of how it's settled over a long period of time, that uh, I think it's, it's time that we finally have to to fix it. And I don't really think that there's uh, they could deny kind of what we're presenting. And and we, we will still have more information coming out, especially kind of the glaring, uh, especially more data and, and geography driven uh, items. We're chatting with the commissioner of the Greater Ontario Junior Hockey League, Brent Garbett, a league that we've extensively covered here at CKNX for a number of years. Brent, I want to ask you a little bit about some concerns. I've talked to some people that are currently in the league and some people that uh, were a big part of the league in various capacities uh, that have some concerns over costs. It, what kind of impact is this going to have on individual player costs, costs for the teams? Because you bump that up in status to Junior A. There are some people that have concerns that I've talked to that it's going to potentially outprice some of the programs, particularly in smaller, smaller towns like Listowel, where I am. What would you say to that? Oh, I would disagree with it. Uh, I mean, solely based on, I mean, there could be costs and everyone can always kind of try to raise their, raise their bar. And sometimes there's more costs in doing that and maybe offering more practices or, or certain things. But first of all, I, I believe our league already is operating as a junior A league, and it's kind of proven based on all the players that are leaving to go on to higher levels, especially all the other junior A leagues that are taking our players. Um, and then in terms of that, I think based on our attendance and our community support, uh, how we already are operating, I think that's uh, that's that's why we won't be uh, just raising costs or things like that. There might be might increase competition across not just Ontario, but across Canada in terms of retaining players. Um, so that in terms of what you're offering and maybe we have to get creative, but there's lots of other things that we'll be working on to just like any other business to, to improve our overall, uh, revenue and, uh, sponsorships and things like that. But in saying that there is no definition and that's part of the issue. There's no definition of what a junior A team or a junior A league is, uh, only that who is the junior A league, who is the junior B league and who is the junior C league. So there is no minimum standard or anything that that you might think that, okay, to be junior A, now we have to be offering this, this, and this, that's part of the issue. So that's kind of what we're, uh, we're trying to raise here that it's, it's really right now a subjective thing that based, based on where you are, what's happened in the past that you're junior A. I wonder as well, Brent, just, uh, in terms of, of working with other leagues, because I know that there are a number of alumni that have played in the GOJHL that have gone on to much higher levels, Europe, even the NHL, in including our friend Mark Shifley, who we're going to be talking about later for a, a not so positive reason. But uh, I know that a lot of players as well, we just saw it recently with young Dixon Grimes, who signed his player agreement with the Guelph Storm. A lot of players end up going on and getting drafted and playing for major junior franchises. Now, I know that they are under a different governing umbrella, the CHL, but has there been any talk between yourself, uh, the league, and their league to try and get them to maybe lobby for you a little bit as well? Or is that even on the table in terms of dealing with the OHA? Uh, you mean the OHL? Yeah. 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 I think, I think that's probably an avenue that probably definitely is a part of our, our strategy. And that's something uh, we would probably consider addressing moving forward. But uh, I think as we saw in our press, our first press release, Mark Hunter, and there'll be other names coming out that, especially in this area that w all the OHL teams that are a lot of them powerhouses that uh, want to put their players here to develop or, uh, and know how good of a league it is to be able to do that, to get them ready for their level. And that's, that's what we're here for. We're any league that's not the NHL is a development league. So we're here to advance players. Um, so whether it's a formal uh, acknowledgement from their league or not, we, we believe that all the people that kind of have spoken out so far and, and might be in the future also validate that as well. And that, that's what we're here for. We're here to develop for players for the next level, regardless of what level that is that they want to go to. So that's up to them to decide where they want to go. We, we want to be able to just keep them here as long as they to stay at home or where uh, as close to home, I guess, 
as long as they want to, so that they're not forced to maybe be told by an agent or, or another team that they are interested in. Well, we want you to play junior A. Can you go to this? Uh, we want you to go to this league or that league. So that's kind of what we want to be able to uh, to eliminate, so that they have that opportunity. As you said, and as you guys know, our teams are very community driven, and having that player around for an extra even one year instead of one, two, or three years. Uh, that just creates even more loyalty and more excitement within the community and attachment to, to the team and to the player. So when they do go on to that, uh, that next level, whether it's all the way up to the NHL, as you mentioned, touched on Mark, but uh, they remember more than a glance, I guess. Uh, the best players obviously wouldn't be here as long, uh, but uh, to have that opportunity that if they want to stay here, we, that's what we want. Brent, best case scenario, when would you like to see this happen by? Uh, obviously this year, uh, that's what we're, that's what we're going to be pushing for. Obviously there's a lot, a lot of things to happen. There's a lot of other things going on in the world, especially we're still living with this pandemic. So uh, a lot of things have to happen. So we're, we're, we totally understand that. But, uh, and the reason why I say next year is, is we've all been off for, by the time we get on the ice, hopefully it's going to be around 18 months, if not longer mm -hmm. that everyone in Ontario, uh, OHL included hasn't played. So I think no better time like now that we have all this and uh not not it's like it's downtime right now as we're all getting ready to to come back but uh i think there's no way better to get excitement for all hockey across ontario even maybe even canada that uh we can finally solve something like this and just get some more excitement get people out whether it's to our league or to another league in ontario that uh people are eager i'm sure like you guys to get back in the ring get back outside doing things even going to a store right now right, where we are so uh, I think that's 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 why timing. We we would definitely uh, strive for for next season. Uh, Brent, speaking of um, next season, just to switch gears a little bit, um, any idea about when a schedule would come out or kind of a timeline on when the GOJHL would be back in the ice and the teams can get back to work? Yeah, so we're we're definitely optimistic and hoping for the fall. Uh, where our, eight, our annual general meeting is just next week, so. There'll be a lot of discussion on that kind of uh, what our ideal plan would be and probably a plan B. Uh, but with with the government's phase, we're keeping a close eye on that. But with their uh, op reopening phase here where uh, indoor sports not allowed till July 26, that pushes obviously a lot of things back uh, where teams wanted to have camps. And normally they have them in April. They wanted to have them early June. Now, not going to be how likely to have them till the end of July. We have to definitely have to take that into consideration for our athletes who've been off that long some skated more than others some got to skate all year so it's not quite as big a deal but also they weren't playing any high performance games like they're used to so that time into getting ready as well as we hopefully like to be able to ideally we'd be like to be able to have fans when we start whether that's 100 percent or 25 percent or whatever the number is uh so all those kind of factors and especially that we have teams in like anywhere in ontario everywhere is different every region uh some of our ranks uh, and our team's ranks are being used for vaccination centers up until potentially August, I've heard so far. So that that all has to be taken care of. I mean, we could probably start some teams on the road, but not for long. We, we need to start it together. Some teams could probably start on the road if they had to, but that has to be close together. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of things that are still way too early to decide, but we're, we're hopeful somewhere around the fall for sure that we can uh, get back. And we're hopeful as well. We would love to get back in the rink and get back to calling this great league, whether it's junior A, junior B, we don't care. We would just like to be in the arenas. Uh, Brent, final question for me. It's a, a two-parter. Is there uh, a drop-dead deadline date that you guys have in mind where you pass that date and if you haven't gotten the junior A designation, you would have to just continue on as junior B at least for this year? And also, um, no matter what happens, are you guys going to be keeping the current three conference format that we've seen for the last number of years yeah for the first question uh there's no no drop down uh drop down date uh uh for sure we're, we're planning to proceed as a gojhl uh, no matter what this season um we'd like that to be junior eight but that i don't think that's really going to change our operation um we're still planning and still working on our organization like any any organization out there with things and ways we can prove and I guess conferences w would be one of those. That's probably something we'll discuss in the future as well, uh, regardless of what that looks like. But um, yeah, that's the the biggest thing for us is is uh, we're definitely working on ourselves, but we we feel we deserve the opportunity to be classified uh, as junior A, and that doesn't really 
uh, change too much in terms of our operation. Uh, it will allow us to do different things for sure, but uh, that's something we're, uh, we're we're kind of planning for both, I guess, if if if, uh, if I can say that. Well, Brent, we're very interested to see where this goes. We're paying very close attention. Obviously, we've got uh, a deep connection with the league. We we love covering it, and uh, we wish you the best of luck going through the summer here. And obviously, keep us in the loop. We appreciate this. Thank you for doing this, my friend. Yeah, no problem, guys. Anytime. Thanks for your time, and uh, I'll, of course, appreciate your support and following of the league. Absolutely. Brent Garbett, the GOJHL commissioner. All right, we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, Clarky, I'm sorry, buddy. We have got to break down what happened to your Toronto Maple Leafs again in the playoffs and discuss Mark. Stop Scheifele saying again. Well. Just stop I'm saying sorry. again. Just stop I'm it. sorry, buddy. We've got to do it. We'll be right back here on MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to MWO Sports, brought to you as always by our friends at CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury, still alongside Clarkie and Steve Sabern. We appreciate our guest, Brent Garbett, the GOJHL commissioner, for jumping on and talking about their quest to be designated a Junior A league instead of Junior B. Uh, obviously, this is a, a tough time of year for Mr. Clark, and many people in southern Ontario, northern Ontario, many parts of Canada and the world, as the Toronto Maple Leafs once again collapse in glorious fashion or inglorious fashion I guess I should say in the first round and Clarkie I know you're really upset I know you're really upset but just quickly while it's top of mind before uh, before we dig into that obviously we want to acknowledge the uh, terrible tragedy that was uh, discovered here in Canada in Kamloops 215 uh, indigenous children's remains were found at a former residential school um, guys this is probably the worst thing that I've ever seen happen in our country it's inexcusable Canada has an awful lot of, uh, of explaining to do uh, this will not be the end of this but we just want to send our regards to the Indigenous community all across Canada, uh, particularly in Kamloops where this was discovered. And uh, also off the back of that, um, Edmonton Oilers defenseman Ethan Bear was subjected to just horrible racist stuff after the Oilers were eliminated. And he came out and made a statement, which was incredible. It's just a joke. It, it, it's not acceptable, guys. I mean, we, we all love sports. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit with, the leaf situation right now, but you know, to go on and abuse athletes directly on their social media and whatever, it's just, it's just not right guys. Uh, please like we, we got to put a stop to this stuff and particularly racism. Uh, it, it's, it just can't continue guys. And I know really quick, we've uh, been talking a lot about uh, as a society, how we can maybe help and listen and, Make sure that something like this with these residential schools never happens again. If you'd like to donate, the Indian Residential School Survivors Society is a charity that's specifically dedicated to helping uh, survivors of the residential school system. Uh, visit www.irsss.ca. Even if you just would like to learn more or donate, we would, uh, we would really appreciate that. All right, guys, uh, let's talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, boy, uh, Clarky, I will just let you, I'll let you just make an opening statement. If you will, if you'd like to do that, your feelings after a few days of digestion from that game seven collapse. Well, as you know, um, I was a little upset. Um, mm -hmm. You sent a, a, a text message that I quickly then blocked you because I didn't want to hear it anymore. I didn't want to hear it from anybody. Yeah, it was the biggest collapse. And I've seen a lot in my time. Yes, yes. It was the worst and biggest collapse of all time. Um, and I sit here today and I have no idea if I was the general manager, what I would do. And that's you, the scariest part of all. I don't know what I would do. You got, you know, Ryan and Steve, how I've been hard on certain players. Um, and Mitch Marner led the way all season for me. This isn't anything new for me to, to rail on Mitch Marner. I don't like his fancy play. Yeah. He racked up a lot of points, but you can't go, 19 games, is it now? Or whatever it is. Eight, 18, 18 games without a playoff sorry. goal. 
without yep. a goal in the playoffs. You have to, at some point, change the way you're playing and do stuff differently. And he looked unwilling to do that. Do you trade a Mitch Marner? Do you try to trade a Mitch Marner? That's a painful decision that you would have to make um, because you know darn well what will happen. He'll score 120 points next season for another team and then probably find his playoff prowess next year with another team. So uh, as I sit here, how do you fix them? They're up against the cap. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it was a depressing few days. I was, I went from mad to being depressed and then it's like, well, you got to do it again next year. Now you got to play 82 games. You're not in an easier division. The thing that ticked me off too, and I know I'm not railing on the officiating because um, that's, I leave Ryan jury to do that. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like a shame that the game changes in the playoffs. Um, and it just seems interference and holding and cross-checking is just part of the game in the playoffs. And it, in my mind, um, benefits a team like the Montreal Canadiens, who I don't think have the skill of the Toronto Maple Leafs, to even the playing field. And I think that sucks. There you go. How's that? I, I completely agree with that. And I mean, I, I don't know how much time we can spend on the show specifically about the officials because I, I mean, I think we're all no, of no. the same, the same mind. I agree. The way they officiate is it definitely benefits the muck and grind teams. It right. slows down star players. I read a story on the athletic about McDavid and him drawing next to no penalties ever so far in the playoffs. Yeah. It's ridiculous. They say they want it to be a speedy league and open it up and be more exciting and market star. I don't know how you do that when you don't call penalties against your star players and let them shine in the playoffs. It just makes no sense. The officiating in the NHL has been a, uh, a, I, I don't even know what to describe it as anymore, guys, but it, it's just really, really bad. But in sticking with the Maple Leafs, Steve, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, there are a lot of opinions flying around, eh? There are a lot of opinions flying around. What would you do? Would you trade one of these quote unquote big four what would you do with the Toronto Maple Leafs in a pretty tight cap situation you know it's there's there's no easy answer because they're still your best players again you look at the regular seasons that they put together like if you start trading people away what all of a sudden you drop in the standings and you don't make the playoffs I'd be more concerned about the inner workings of the team. I mean, their power play was crappy. You talk about bad officiating and not getting power play opportunities. Well, it didn't matter. They couldn't score anyway. Um, one of the big questions I had is game seven, Leafs are behind. Their power play unit's on the ice, and they have Sandine running the point. Where's Morgan Riley? Is he not your top defenseman? Why is he not in the clutch situation to give your team the best opportunity. Uh, I mean, and I wish there's, you know, someone we could talk to to explain that, but it just, everything the Leafs did backfired on them um, in, 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 in those games. Uh, and Montreal had some puck luck. Uh, but when you look at the game last night too, uh, against Winnipeg, do you guys see that goal that was scored? Corey Perry going to the dirty part of the ice? He scored he twice like that against the Leafs. Yeah, and I said it at the time. I would much rather have Corey Perry than Joe Thornton. I said it when it happened. And that's the kind of stuff that did. Yes. And Muzzin was certainly missed in game number seven. He was. if you but, looked at game six, when Muzzin, yeah, but, net, you know, creating opportunities yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, it's, they missed that in game seven. Yeah. Well, he scored two goals. But they should have had the depth to beat these guys. And after five games or mm -hmm. four games, they were up three games to one. Like everyone I talked to, even some Hab fans says, yeah, it's over. Like I thought it was over. And boy, I was wrong. And Can't say uh, that with Carey Price in that. No, I, I know. But they just beat them three in a row. Twice in Montreal. So you yep. got to think they're going to close it out. No, I did. they can't do it. When, they when can't do it. They don't have that killer instinct. How are they going to get it? I don't know. But the other point, Steve, about your interference, like talking about not calling penalties, they weren't calling the penalties on the interference. So they weren't getting the power plays. Yeah, their power play sucked. And to get back to that, 
Manny Malhotra has to take the hit here. Like if he was the guy, and every time they had a a power play that you would sh- they would show Manny Malhotra right <laughs> running up a play, he's got to take it. Like he he has to. Someone has to take the hit here. There'll be team. a change there. There There'll has be to be. And you know what? Like we've talked about it before. I would love to see your cousin out in 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 Toronto. Um, he's a free agent, Brad Shaw. He's a free agent, and I think he would be a terrific addition. You know, you talk too about maybe maybe Sheldon Keefe wasn't tough enough on these guys. Well, you can't blame Sheldon Keefe for not being tough enough on these guys when no. you fired Mac, Mike Babcock for being too tough on these guys. So it's like, what do these guys want, right? Like, what do they want? Like, what do they need to get motivated? Like, it was game seven was such a downer and depressing and so frustrating to watch as a Leaf fan. It's like, are these guys trying? It didn't look like they were trying. And I'm just talking about two main people. Yeah. You know who I'm talking about. You're, you're talking about Matthews and Marner. And I, I thought Matthews was poor. It was probably the worst four, three or four game stretch I've ever seen him play in the NHL. And and Marner, yeah, again, and it's confusing. And I know it's a completely different level. But I mean, I watched Mitch Marner and attended a lot of his games live when he was a London Knight. And this kid was he's one of the greatest junior hockey players of all time. I mean, it's not an overstatement to say that. And has he had the greatest shot ever at any point of his playing career? No, but he would score. And it, he seems afraid to shoot the puck sometimes. Um, he's almost got Thomas Caberle syndrome a little bit. And, and, <laughs> yeah, it's, a good and one. it's frustrating. Yeah. And and on the, on the negative side, you would say, what is it going to take to motivate these guys? Well, you would figure a lot of people, the money. I'm not going to argue about Mitch Marner's contract. He has an agent that represents him. Did he get overpaid? I still believe he did. You can talk to me about his point totals in the regular season. That's great. We're not after the regular season anymore. Steve Dangle said it the other night on his live streams he was doing. They could go 82-0 and next year, and I won't care because it doesn't matter anymore. And that's a point you get to when, and here's the good news. That's a point you get to when your team is really good and can compete. You get to a point eventually when you don't get to the top of the hill where you go, I don't care anymore about the regular season. In 2018, when the Caps won, I think I watched 40 regular season games. If that, I I couldn't be bothered. After two straight years of Penguin eliminations, I couldn't take it anymore. And then they went and did it. What's it going to take? It's going to just take more of them taking these lumps. I I personally don't think you should trade any of these guys. I've said in the past, if you're going to trade one guy, it'd be Marner because you'd get the most for him. But I don't think that you're going to get back the same type of value. People are going, well, let's trade Marner and we'll get a couple picks. We'll get a decent third line center because Kerfoot's like gone. No, you cannot do that. And then we'll take the extra money. We'll take the extra money and we'll sign Seth Jones and we'll do this. It's like, guys, we're not playing EA Sports NHL 21. Here, it, like stuff like that doesn't just fall into your lap. The only way I see trading Mitch Marner is if you can get a trading partner like the Edmonton Oilers, um, and they want to shuffle the deck. So if you're talking a, a dry sidle Marner kind of deal, or or even McDavid, like I'm not saying those are the only combatants in the in the uh, in a trade like that, but you would need to shift superstars both teams. Because you're not doing it for a bag of pucks and to uh, free up cap space. Exactly, and and, and from from Edmonton's perspective, they're just not going to do that. And uh, like, uh, and they they why not? Why least, wouldn't Edmonton do that? That's a terrible trade. I wouldn't trade Mitch Marner for Leon Drysital. Uh, absolutely not. That like well, how again, far did they we're get? not playing well. <sighs> I'm not going to entertain that again. We're not playing NHL 21 here. They didn't win any games. So I, I I just say, and the Leafs brass came out and said it that all four are coming back. Of course, not having John Tavares was huge. And that's unfortunate. We're glad that he appears to be feeling healthy, but they won three games right after that. I know. Get like, I'm done with the excuses. They just joked. They did. They did. They absolutely did. But Steve, to echo what you said earlier, Montreal had puck luck and hockey, unfortunately, is the hardest game to win in the salary caps. One thing, but we've said it before on the show, Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews, no matter how productive they are or aren't 
can't have the same type of impact as LeBron James or James Harden can on an NBA court where they play 45 minutes if they're hot of the 48. What's the max you're going to play as a forward? 25, 26 minutes if you're really rolling, usually 22. So you're going to play a third of the game, even if you're the best player, and have the rest of it up to chance. And there's no out of bounds. The puck is active the whole time unless someone flips it out, which Mitch Marner did again. It. I understand you're frustrated, but I think it's just one of those things, and they're going to come back and reload. Steve, your thoughts? Um, you know, the just Montreal seemed to gain momentum, and their young players got an opportunity to shine, like oh, the yeah, Suzuki and Caulfield. Uh, had in the la- later stages of that series uh, was amazing. And, you know, you always say your best player is going to be your best players. And Toronto's best players weren't their best. And it no. doesn't matter how much depth you have. If your top guys don't give you a couple points here or there, like to me, Jason Spezza was one of the best players on the ice. Spezza and Nylander were their best two players. Yep. Like, yeah. Jason Spezza should not be your best player. Great, absolutely for not. Fantastic You're absolutely for right. Him. Mm-hmm. But he was trying. He was trying. That yeah. was the difference. You could see him trying, skating hard, hitting people, getting into the tough areas. And I didn't Jack see McMurder doing that. Yeah, at all. That's, that's what's going to have to change, right? And Jack Campbell is fantastic. I don't want anybody to to be ripping on him, and for the most part, they aren't. I I saw this tweet. Here's the most damning thing I saw, and Ray Ferraro tweeted this out. Uh, the Maple Leafs in Game Seven, their forwards after 40 minutes had six shots on goal. Six, I believe, after two periods, they had 15 total. I mean. That's not, and again, I, I have a hard time criticizing guys. Yeah, they're, they're making a lot of money, and my favorite uh, yeah. team, their players were making lots of money too, and they finally won whatever. You you cannot. Yeah, but at least they won some series money. before they won. They, they did won, won some, some playoff series. series. They like, did win some you know, series. This team hasn't won a series. Funnily enough, also blew a 3-1 lead to Montreal in 2010. Yeah. Uh, but. That's you know, the other thing too, though, is like fans are tossing out all these trades. Let's trade Mitch Marner for Leon Dry, whatever. Clark, I don't mean to pick on you there, but people are throwing out all kinds. I'm not of saying trade. one for one, right? I know, I, I, I know. I said that. But I'm just saying that's the only kind of trade you might yeah. in, entertain well, for one sure. of those guys. Well, maybe, maybe guys, when, when you look back at some of the you know sports teams that you know the Toronto Blue Jays in '91 got kicked to the curb by the twins before they went to one on to win back to back world series in 92 and 93. Maybe this is their, the Leafs lost this year and moving forward with the core group they have, we'll be able to put something together next season. Yeah. That's what we said last year. I, I'm just that's, saying there's always next year, right? There's always next year. Look at the blue Jays in 87. 87, but, they had a great team, and they I think that was the year they lost the last seven games of the season. Fernandez broke his elbow, and they lost seven in a row, and, and they were like five games up with six games to go. Yeah, that's when they lost in Detroit, wasn't it? Yeah, when, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that and that's one of the things that I um, compare this collapse to. But, you know, guys, we've been talking about uh, guests that we want to get on the show, and you know, when I see Mitch Marner in the penalty box with his head down and, and Nylander consoling him, that's not good in my mind. That's not good. Um, and one of the guests I would love to get on in the next few weeks is Paul Dennis, sports psychologist. Um, he was a mental coach for the Leafs for a few years. Um, and he would be a great guy to talk to about the mental aspect of the game. So hopefully in the next few weeks, we can uh, hook up with Paul and have him on. That'd be great. And and that's the thing, right? And we're seeing it in other sports. People don't understand money doesn't guarantee you much. You you get it as, uh, and we're seeing it in hockey now and other sports, you're getting it earlier and you're getting it now based on what 
it looks like you will do over the life of that contract. It mm -hmm. used to be you would play a few years, get paid pretty well, and then you'd score a big contract after years of great production and get paid for what you did. Now it's changing, and you see it with Naomi Osaka at the French Open dropping out, doesn't want to deal with media right now, and I respect that. You see it in other sports. That There's a pressure there. Here's what I would say, though, in, in, in fans, and I get it, trying to be optimistic, but comparing it, to the Jays or other sports. It's no salary cap in baseball. It's no salary cap. And people are like, well, you know, Steve Eiserman, and, and I've been one of the ones saying it to you, Clarky, for years. I see a lot of similarities, young, young core with my caps back in the day when they, funnily enough, blew a 3-1 lead to Montreal. That was the heyday of the young guns caps era. Here's the thing, though. None of those guys were making $10 million. I know that the league's, financial landscape has changed, but the Leafs have put all their eggs into four baskets. Nylander's contract looking pretty good now, so if you want to call it three double-digit baskets, and that is their reality now. You're not going to be able to move those contracts to a lot of teams without taking a lot of money back. This is what they are. Okay, and and to say, oh well, you know, Steve Eiserman was thirty two and blah blah. The Detroit Red, the Detroit Red Wings, there was no salary cap when the Red Wings won in ninety six, ninety seven, and two thousand two. They had like eight Hall of Famers on their team. The Luke Robitaille was on their fourth line, making like six million dollars. That that doesn't happen now. Yeah. The salary cap has changed everything. But you yep. could compare it to Tampa Bay. I'll say that. Remember Tampa Bay? Remember when they got swept by Columbus? Yeah. Nikita Kucherov, who a lot of people would compare as Mitch Marner is their Kucherov, that skilled guy dangling around. Nikita Kucherov was horrific in that four-game sweep. He was awful. He got suspended, mm -hmm. I think, too, in game three for kneeing somebody, I want to say. He was off his hinges. Then they came back and they won the Stanley Cup. That's a more apt comparison. But we'll see. But for right now, this is what the Leafs are. And they have to find a way, those four guys, to get the rest of whatever team is around them next year yep. and fire them into where they're supposed to be. And just to five it straight off. first rounds. Woo. Just to finish it off. And I, I know like... Maybe I was a little bit of a suck, and I and I blocked, and I got off social anti social media. It's fine. It, it just it it just it. I I I wear it on my sleeve. I wear, <laughs> I wear it right here. That's where I wear it. I know. I, you know, I had a leaf shirt on every day at work. I I had my leaf cup every day at work. Like I was like, oh yeah, three to one, they're gonna win this. And now I gotta I gotta sit and face it. I gotta sit and face it when my buddy goes, wow, LOL, after they blow an overtime game that they could have won the series. I got to face it when my producer of this show, his wife wants to console me or whatever she wanted to do to talk. To, I, I'm she sorry. just wants to bake you a pie, man. Well, that's great. She can bake me a cherry pie. That's okay. awesome. But I mean, it's just like I, I now understand that the Leafs are a laughing stock to a lot of people. And I never realized that before, but I think I do now. So if you guys um, were like that, I'm not talking about you two guys. I'm talking about any of our listeners. Yeah, I get it now. I get it. I had a bet with one of our colleagues at the radio station who's a huge Habs fan. It was a very friendly bet, and we had very friendly discussions along the way. But I, I, I felt at three to one, I didn't say a word to him because I know he didn't want to hear it. And yeah. I didn't post anything on social media. I didn't say anything to anyone except wear my logo with pride. And I came home that night. I was out watching the game and I came home. And the first thing I did was come up to my deck and took that flag down and said, that's not going back up until next September. I nearly Googled tattoo removal, but I didn't do it. Oh, Clark. Well, that's good because I have some friends who have just outright sworn off the Leafs and now they're Seattle Kraken sure. fans. It's, sure they are. There are some people that are upset and I understand, buddy. Well, I I, I get it. It's, it's tough, but I still think they're talented enough to keep going right back to the well. And like Steve said as well, there's a, a weird element of luck with hockey. It, it's not like baseball where the same thing happens. It's the same play every single time. You well, walk and, up and to the goal, plate and you goal, swing at a ball. The Gallagher goal. 
Yeah, it, that was yeah. Patrick Laleem and Joe Newendike from the early 2000s. It was. The Leafs knew they were going to win because Patrick Laleem was in that. Jack Campbell played great. Cannot blame him. And no. I'm happy that because he's hopefully going to be the number one goalie next year. They it, couldn't score. Let's it looks go. that way. Exactly. I don't want to. It was a really bad goal. Yes. Score. Someone score. Right. Okay. Score. Anyway, yeah, it's it's tough. Clarky and I are going to do a bonus episode uh, that'll be available on our podcast network and on cknx.ca where we're really going to dive into a, a deep talk because there's just so much to dissect over the, those seven games. All right, we'll take a quick break. When we come back, our wagering expert, Chris Abbott, he's back from vacay and he's excited to talk about some wagering for the upcoming weekend and revisit our player pool from the season and our first round picks here on MWO Sports brought to you by coolbet.co. Stay tuned. This is MWO Sports. Back to wrap things up here on MWO Sports, brought to you by CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury alongside Clarky and Steve Sabrin, and we're very pleased to be joined by our wagering expert, at least our regular wagering expert, Chris Abbott, back from The Rock. How are you, buddy? I'm I'm doing well, guys. I missed you. I hope I uh, hope Pat treated you well while I was away. He was fantastic, man, and he made a lot of good picks as well. So you've got some shoes to fill here, some hot shoes over the last couple of weeks. But before we dig into some wagering on the weekend here, lots of great stuff coming up, more golf, more auto racing, more baseball, more hockey. Let's revisit our regular season pool. Now, our listeners and viewers will remember the four of us drafted. I think what we take four players and a goalie. I think was the format or something. Anyway, let's just get to it because I know I didn't win, so I don't care. But let's let's get the uh, the card up and we'll go over our final standings. Steve bringing up the rear and fourth. He had a he had a tough break with a couple of his players. Now I know that I'm sitting in third overall, so we can just unveil that. And it was pretty close. The last time we checked in on this as the season was closing, I think there was a difference of three or four points between Mr. Abbott and Mr. Clark. Let's see how it all shakes out, Producer Adam. Who is the king of the pool? Oh, oh my goodness. Clarky, uh, uh, you got to win, buddy. Yeah. Uh, Clarky needed this. No, I didn't. This is regular season, <laughs> and it means nothing. Zero. <laughs> nothing. Just we- take the win. Did we put money on this or do I owe yes, money now? We all put 200 bucks in. No, no. You don't remember? No, no, I don't. I don't. Just email me the just eat transfer. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, no well, sweat. we're we're not going to be uh paying for your uh what? restock of tissues, Come uh, Clarky. On. So sorry about that, brother. But congratulations, man. You Thank won you. something. I Thank mean, t- take it and run, brother. All yeah. right. Now, obviously, uh Chris, while you were away, uh like you mentioned, our friend Pat Gregoire from Coolbet, who did a great job filling in for you. He joined us to make first round predictions. Let's bring those up, producer Adam. Uh you can start us off wherever you like here and we'll just kind of react to the graphic but we all made picks for the first round let's go pit new york uh i was very confident in sid crosby now clarky and uh clarky once again you're the only guy that called this right barry trotz and the islanders getting by uh the pittsburgh penguins now uh, in five games too i had the pens in six steve had them in seven uh pat had the pens in six but there you go. You, you take it away in six games. So you were pretty bang on there, Clarky. Thank Let's you. Move yeah. on. Good yeah. for you. I didn't you're, get them all right, but I got this one right. You're on a streak here so far. Let's examine the next one here. Yeah, boy. Oh. Washington Capitals. Good grief. We were very, we were all very confident in the caps in six or seven. The Bruins walked them in five. One of, I, I said it last week, I believe it was the most embarrassing playoff performance I've ever seen in Washington Capitals history. They were mm. terrible. And uh, we can move on from this one. For what it's worth, I would have picked Boston in that series. Oh, well, there you go. That's uh, that's why you're the king wagering expert, aren't you? You can rub that one in Pat's face, I suppose. Nashville, Carolina, we all had the Hurricanes and the Hurricanes triumph, but boy, the Nashville pushed them a little bit. I had them sweeping, uh, as did Clarkey, and yeah. Pat had them in a sweep as well. They managed to go six, but we all walk away with a win in the Hurricanes series. Let's move on to the next one. 
Yeah, Florida, Tampa, we were all pretty heavy on the bolts. I I, I mean, Florida, they put up a, a good fight, took them to six and had some impressive young guys show up. But the bolts, I mean, man, they're just too deep. It's funny, too, because like Florida was favored. Florida had home ice. Florida finished ahead of them in the standings. That's we right. all picked the bolts and the bolts win. So there you oh. go. Nikita Kucherov, I don't know if you've heard of him. He's a difference maker, and he made a difference in this series. All right, let's move on to the next one. What are we, four or five deep here? St. Louis and uh, producer Adams Avalanche. I had the abs in six. This was the only sweep uh, next to Winnipeg and Edmonton, of course, which we'll get to. But boy, oh boy, I, I didn't think it would be a sweep, but I had them in six. Clarkie and Steve, you both had the Blues. Pat, of course, taking the abs in five. No one had a sweep here. They just ragdolled the St. Louis Blues, and and, uh, they're doing the same thing right now to the Vegas Golden Knights. So uh, mixed bag there as well. All right, we'll move on to the next one here. Vegas, Minnesota. We were all pretty heavy on Vegas, boy, and they got pushed all the way to seven. That Minnesota team, they're going to be scary going forward with Kirill Kaprizov, but we all took the Golden Knights, so we all take a W there as we move on to, what is this, our second last one? Yeah, boy, we all had the Leafs. Oh, Clarky, We better move on from this one quickly. We don't want Clarky to linger on this. Let's just get out of here. We all know what happened. And boy, I had the Oilers in seven, uh, as did Steve and Pat. We thought that this was going to be a seven game war for sure. And whew, the Jets walked all over Connor and Leon, and they get the second sweep that we've seen so far. In I had the, the Jets. You did have the Jets, absolutely. But uh, we all had it going <laughs> seven. Trying to figure oh. something that's you know, giving me a little. Yeah, hey man, Out take the take here. the credit where it's due, buddy. We so what all... are the standings? How, how many did we all get right? Do we have the graphic for that? Or I don't know if we have a graphic for how many we all got right. I think I only ended up with four out of the eight. So uh, yeah, it's uh, you know the playoffs. They're exciting in the NHL. You never know what's going to happen, and and I guess that's kind of the point. We're going to refrain as well, Abbott, folks. What were you? From... Yeah, what, did, did you bet on every series, Chris? Um, I did not, but probably it would have been about half and half. Uh, I would have taken Florida. I think I said Florida was a, a decent pick. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, clearly, Tampa's been steamrolling. Um, I would have had the Leafs, although I did think there was a path for Montreal to win. Didn't see it happening the way it did. Um, I think I, uh, for both those series, I, I thought the underdogs had a chance, but I, I did think it was going to be Toronto Edmonton in the second round. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's been topsy turvy. I, I thought Pittsburgh might've got by the Islanders as well. So mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing obviously is the teams that play that tight checking style with good goaltending and, and don't play with a lot of risk, um, are having success. They certainly are, and that's the beauty of the NHL playoffs. You just never really know what's going to happen, even when you think you do. Uh, all right, Abbott, let's get right back down to business. This is why we have you on the show, my friend. Uh, what are some hot picks heading into this weekend? There's lots going on. Uh, yeah, there is a lot going on. So uh, Friday night, I, I think the Vegas Golden Knights at home in Game 3 is uh, certainly a possibility. I, I don't think this is going to be a sweep. I think we're getting uh, you know, Colorado a lot of recency bias on how good they've been. And I think that's, that's well-deserved, but we can't forget, forget about this Vegas team. We can't forget about the advantage they're going to have playing the T-Mobile arena, which uh, I presume is going to be next to sold out. Um, and you've got a lot of people in Vegas who are looking to get out and, <laughs> and let the energy out and have a good time. So I do think that'll play a factor in game three and they're a home underdog at plus 109. Uh, so I, I do think that's a, a pretty good bet right there. Uh, game two, Canadians and Jets, uh, it's a pick em. Um the, the total's at five and a half. I, I think, you know, you take away the first period of game one, I think, uh, I think under five and a half is probably where these games will fall. Hellebuck will be better. Um, you're going to have offensive players out of both lineups with uh, Shifley and Evans. So, uh, you know, Montreal has a hard time scoring at the best of times, and uh, and Winnipeg's got to play against that stifling team in Montreal. So those would be the two picks I look at uh, going into Friday night. Of course, then you got Team Canada uh, with a you know a miracle win over Russia at the IIHF World Championship. So they've got to run up against the U.S. in the playoffs. Um, that'll be interesting. The line's not out for that as we're recording this, but I think that's uh, that's going to be fun. Um, yeah, and then you got the French Open going, the Memorial, the U.S. Women's Open. I know Brooke Henderson, uh, a lot of people were on her coming into this uh, weekend as well. So there's a lot happening. We haven't even talked about the NBA or the fact that the Seattle Seahawks are plus 325 to win the NFC West. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot going on. 
Russ is cooking. Russ is cooking. Really quick, guys. We referenced it earlier that that Mark Shifley hit on on Jake Evans. Boy, that raised the ire of the hockey world. A guy that has no suspension history, and I think we're probably all on the same page. It's a pretty dirty play as of recording. No announcement yet on his suspension as we chat right now, but I'll toss this at you, Abbott. Under or over two and a half games for Mark Shifley? I think that's the right line. I think for that hit, it should be one to two games. With the with the outrage and the injury, we might see over. Uh, so I think what's actually going to happen is is different from my opinion on what should happen. Yes, I, I think most of us feel that way about every suspension ever under George <laughs> Peros. Uh, I, I'm going to call it at three games. All right, guys, we're out of time. Great to have you back, Chris. We appreciate this, buddy. Looking forward to having you back next week as well. My pleasure, guys. Chat with you next week. All right, guys, remember, you can listen to this show Friday nights at 6 p.m. on CKNX AM 920 and CKNX.ca. Remember, we are going to be, now that the Leafs are out, unfortunately, Clarky, we're going to be airing all the Jays games on CKNX. You can catch every Jays game. We typically will lead into that if they're playing on a Friday night, which they usually are. Remember, you can follow us on social media at MWO underscore sports, and you can find the podcast online on all the best podcast apps. Watch the show Friday nights at 8, Sunday nights at 9 with our friends on Whiteman TV and Friday nights debuting on our YouTube channel at nine. One more time, guys, uh, if you can, please donate or at least visit the Indian Residential School Survivors Society and uh, and help out in any way you feel necessary. www.irsss.ca. Uh, for myself, Ryan Drury, our guest this week, Brent Garbett, the GOJHL commissioner. That's Clarkie. That is Steve Sabrin. That's our wagering expert, Chris Abbott from CoolBet. We appreciate you listening to and watching MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. Mm-hmm.